you good. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Or well, good afternoon, sorry. I had good morning for the 10 o'clock start. <laughs> it's been amended to 2 p.m., so good afternoon. Today we continue a further <coughs> round of hearings focused on the priority areas of child protection and uh, criminal justice system. This week will be focused on the criminal justice system. But before we start today's hearings, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our new commissioner, Kerip Mara Gunditjmara Man, Travis, Commissioner Travis Lovett. Uh, welcome, Travis, to your first hearing. We're very honoured to have you here. Uh, delighted that we're back to the strength of five. Welcome. And uh, I think uh, perhaps we probably should introduce the other commissioners. Rosh, do, do you know? Just, well, just me. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Sue Ann, you know, okay, we've just said hello. Maggie said hello as well. Great, okay. All right, so <clears throat> I'd like now to uh, invite Commissioner Hunter to give the welcome to country and acknowledgement. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Rundry and pay my respects to elders uh, and ancestors. All those that have come before us, so we're able to have voice here today. Uh, and acknowledge their, their resistance and their work in, in pushing forward in truth and justice. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, our um, witness here today um, and his ancestors as well. And may Bunja watch over us today as we conduct Aboriginal business. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Hunter. Welcome. Welcome, Michael Ross. Yes. Um, Council. May I have appearances, please? Uh, yes, uh, if the Commission pleases, I appear as Council Assisting. Commission. If the Commissioner pleases, I appear for the State of Victoria. Council. Thank you, Chair. Um, before I introduce our first witness for today, uh, we seek a standing order be made pursuant to Section 26 subsection one of the Inquiries Act 2014, namely that one, we're approved by the chair at the request of council assisting, witness outlines and annexures to those outlines and other documents tendered as evidence may be deemed necessary to be withheld from publication or published in part where, based on the subject matter and following consultation with the witness as to their consents and preferences, the Chair considers that A, prejudice or hardship may be caused to any person, including harm to their safety or rep reputation, um, in brackets section 26.1a. B, the nature and subject matter of the information is sensitive, in brackets section 26.1b. C, there is a possibility of any prejudice to legal proceedings, in brackets section 26.1c. <coughs> D, the conduct of the proceeding would be more efficient and effective, in brackets, section 26.1d, or E, the commissioner otherwise considers the prohibition or restriction appropriate, in brackets, section 26.1e. Two, any oral evidence given by a witness at the hearing in respect of the matters in paragraph one to the extent captured in a transcript or video recording not be published, and three, a copy of this order is to be published on Uruk's website, um, urukjusticecommission.org.au. Thank you, Mr Goodwin. I make the orders in the terms sought. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if the Commission pleases, I now call today's next witness, Uncle Ross Morgan. Welcome. Um, Uncle Ross, do you undertake to provide truthful evidence to the Uruk Justice Commission today? Yes. Um, you've provided an outline of evidence um, of the 5th of March 2023. Um, uh, are you happy with the content of, of that statement? Yes. Um, I, I tender that statement, Chair. Thank you. Um, Uncle Ross, could you please first introduce yourself um, personally and, and, and culturally to the Commissioners? Yeah, um, my name is Ross 
Ross Morgan. I'm, I'm um, Yorta Yorta Elder. I also have connections to um, Tunnerong um, people through great 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 grandfather, grand, great great grandfather, and and, Gun and no, Tunnerong through a great 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 grandfather, and Gundachamara through a great great grandfather, and have, um, but I identify as a Yorta Yorta man through um, my Yorta Yorta grandfather and grandmother and mother. And, and when were you born, Uncle Ross? I was born on the 14th of October, 1954. Um, and you're um, a qualified drug and alcohol counsellor and currently work at um, the organisation Dadi Munro as a coordinator of community programs right now? Yeah, I, I um, well, one of the things I do was, was drug and alcohol uh, with, um, with um, VARS, uh, Victoria Aboriginal Health Service, but now I work with Dadi Mongwaro as um, community programs um, coordinator for the uh, Northern and New Yum region with uh, men's group, men's behavioural change groups. And so you've been working in that space for the last 20 years, is that right? No, not with not with Darty, but in that area, like drug and alcohol, uh, work with Stolen Gen, um, um, Link Up Victoria for about seven years of of no, might have been about five years out of the seven years before I went to from there to Darty. Um, and I just want to ask some questions now about your um, childhood, and and I know some of this story is hard and involves trauma, so we'll just take our, our time. Um, whereabouts did you grow up? Well, initially I grew up in Maroopna, which is in the Golden Valley, um, not far from Shepparton. So Shepparton and Maroopna were my kind of um, areas where I grew up. Um, as a baby, I was uh, left on, on the riverbank at uh, the flats and Dash's paddock in between Shep and Maroopna. Then, uh, from when I was about five or six years old, moved into Rumbalara once that got established. And eventually from there moved into um, uh, Rosalind Street in Marupna and spent most of my childhood life growing up Rumba and, and, um, and Rosalind Street. And, and so you were first raised at um, Dash's Paddock um, when you were very young. Um, do you remember, um, uh, did you have any memories of that time at Dasha's Paddock? Yeah, well, no, I, I remember the flats. The flats were um, um, on the river, right on the river, and we would only move up to Dasha's Paddock when there was a flood. So um, um, I don't recall any floods when I was there, but um, um, we moved up. Um, I remember I remember the, the floor and, and I remember my... Mum and Dad um, there then, but they um, eventually adopted me. They weren't my mum and dad. They were aunties of, of, of my... an auntie of my mother. And I, they were, I was raised believing that they were my mum and dad, so until... I didn't realise until um, probably just before my teens that, that um, they weren't my mum and dad. And what was it like growing up with them, um, first in Dasha's paddock and then when you eventually moved to Rumba? Um, oh, that was the best. Um, you know, my childhood with them was um, loving and caring and, and, and really well looked after. I think I was one of the most spoiled kids on, on Rumba at the time and had everything. I think I was the first kid to ever 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 get a football and they, you know, like, uh, I used to lend it out to other kids. But... Um, yeah, that was. They both died on the same day when I was seven years old. Well, I believed it was the same day. I told it was told it was the same day, but I learnt um, years later, many years later, that it was a little bit after one died, a little bit after the other. So there was a lot of trauma there around separation in my childhood growing up. Uh, and and um, and, and just. You mentioned in your statement a story that you heard about the Queen driving past Dasha's paddock. Um, yeah, did you I'm, tell the commissioners that story? Yeah, that oh, that was that was 
that that's the story of of Dacia's paddock. It's about you know like um, um, the houses on the side of the road, and they were down on the flat side. Um, um, there was ashen bags put up along these trees and that to cover the um, Aboriginal people, and and the Queen apparently asked what's what's down there, what's beyond that, and they were, she was told that it was um, that's where the Aboriginal uh, shanties or whatever they, they umpies are and that's where the Aboriginal people live down there and um, I wasn't I was born that year I wasn't there at that time but uh, I wasn't wasn't long after that that I, I was sent down there because I remember there I actually remember the Eschen bags around they ended up using for for part of their arts uh, the, the timber and the, and the tin were t get, gotten out of the local tip you know everyone got their building material out of the tip and we lived on the edge of the the tip at Dash's paddock and um, um, yeah the Queen went past there in 54 and I believe that's why um, they eventually established Rumbalara um, which was done a fair few about three years later I think uh, eventually um, sent us all to Rumbalara. And, and was it a large Aboriginal community at Rumbalara when you were growing up? It was there? ten, ten um, concrete slab arts that were built, and I think there was two bedrooms and and a kitchen and a lounge, lounge all in one. Uh, eventually, many years later, they built wash house on laundries or wash houses on the back of them but that was many years later before and it wasn't long after that they, they closed it down and you you mentioned in your statement a story about your auntie and uncle being or your mum and dad being asked by police for permits to live at um, Rumbalara yeah. do you remember that story uh, that was another uncle and auntie who'd come from Melbourne that was only only Merle and Uncle Alec Jackamoss who'd come from Melbourne to visit us and a divvy van pulled up then, I think it was an old H, HR divvy van, HD divvy van. And a couple of young constables jumped out and tried to get my uncle and auntie to leave Rumbalara because they never had permits to visit us. And, um, and my auntie really um, got aggravated and, and told him to, you know, who are your superiors? I need to talk to your superiors. You, you just can't do this. And 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 eventually, uh, after a, a couple of, um, not threats, but, you know, told them that we're going to get um, see into this, um, they left and left it, left them there, actually. Um, but the old truck farmer, Mr Young, across the way, Every time he'd see a car coming onto Rumba, he would let the police know. So it was just common thing that uh, if police come on there, that um, that if people come on there in cars, um, police would come out and check out who they were. Um, and eventually, um, you you were moved out of um, Rumba into commission houses in Marupna. Um, and you, you say in your statement that was done to, to assimilate us, to assimilate. Well, I, I'm, think, I'm thinking it was for no other reason. Um, the same thing happened um, pre-walk off at Camaragunja. Once, you know, um, we get organised as Aboriginal people and there were um, people walk, walking around uh, organising um, and it was just to get... Um, um, the Rumba organisation established something established for the Rumbalara people, medical centres, centres and all that. Be it, but um, I think we, because we were were getting too outspoken about how we were living, we were eventually all not all all at the same time. Eventually, most of us got moved into town, and I think um, I think that was. Although I, I, I loved living at Roslyn Street, I think that was a part of the the our, our our downfall when we were disconnected and we weren't kind of really really um, communicating that all that much about staying stronger. Although not long after that, um, Rumbalara was developed. Um, I seen it as as um, another 
you know, like a thing where they, another process where they disconnect us and as, as a group and, and, um, and assimilate us. Uh, and I think that was um, a view taken by a lot of people, but um, um, at the end of the day, um, I didn't... Um, I didn't mind uh, living in, in Marupna because I went to school at Marupna and I played football for Marupna and, and uh, as a kid, yeah. And, and, and you've just mentioned going to school in Marupna. Um, you've described in your statement a number of experiences of racism while you're at school um, and the um, uh, challenge of that. Um, do you mind... Um, telling the commissioners what racism you experienced or saw while you were at school? Oh, just, just, it's just a, f a feeling of race, being racist. Racism is that, you know, you don't get the same opportunity, you don't get the same uh, chance as, as, as um, non-Indigenous uh, children and, um, you know, even being called, um, you know, uh, black bastards and stuff like that, you know, like, and not expecting to, not expected to succeed in anything anyhow. So why give him, why give him the opportunity? You know, like, like my experiences with it all is is that every time we did succeed in anything, they'd pull it apart. You know, I felt that uh, from an early age. That's why I left school around sixteen years old. And so that. Uh, that racism that you experienced had an impact on you that meant that you left school at the age of 16, is that, is that right? Yeah, I didn't uh, have a, a sense of uh, freedom or, or um, didn't experience... It was all like I was, I was being watched and, and being controlled and even, even when in my teens um, police started to... You know, I started to be harassed by police and all that kind of stuff, and it's like uh, it felt like that I was never, um, I was never going to get an opportunity. You know, like and everything I did was didn't didn't um, wasn't worth worth the effort. You know, uh, and and you mentioned in your statement that. Um, uh, that police harassment and brutality probably started when you were about 15 or 16 years old. Yeah, I, would, I, I, I did... Um, um, probably, probably not 16, maybe, maybe 17, something like that, um, experienced violence from police. And, um, and over the years, there was some extreme violence that I've experienced as well, but more... Probably more into my twenties, um, um, it became more extreme. And what are some of the incidents that that you um, went through um, of, uh, of of police violence? Uh, well, I've been bashed a, f a few times in the Shepherd and Souls. Um, um, pre coming to Melbourne, and it all happened down here as well, but. Um, um, I remember one one day being in in the cells, and and um, there was about maybe six, maybe seven, maybe eight police standing around a circle, and they'd just punch me from one side to another, and and uh, and I'd be kind of um, screaming at them, and and um, and that went on for a fair while. And then one of the young constables, he was probably about the youngest out of all of them, he, might have, uh, he just walked into the room, he said, he just pulled them all up, you know, pulled these all, all these older, older police officers up and said, what are you effing doing? You know, pull it up, you know, like, and, and um, it was just common, it was just common uh, practice for, for um, our people back then to get um, violated against or get violence. Um, and it wasn't the only instance. There was another instance where I got pulled... Oh, well, I never got pulled over. It was actually... Uh, we pulled into the, an hotel in Shepparton there and, and the police pulled in after us and and there was an incident where they said the car's overloaded and I just jumped out and said, well, I'll, I'll, ju I'll just jump out and that'll solve the problem, you know, like... And 
And they just said, well, are you going to be a, a smart ass or something like to them terms? And, and then I got battered with, um, with batons by two of, two of the officers. And the other one was um, uh, kicked me and, and um, a couple of times and then, then chucked in the back of the divvy. And, and when I uh, got out of that, they had nothing to hold me on, I think. I went and seen lawyers and that. We, we talked about charging them. And eventually, um, you know, they, we had a pretty strong case. We had a lot of witnesses. And eventually, um, my lawyer and, and the, whoever was investigating them come up with a solution that uh, um, they charged me because I, I knocked off a police officer's hat and I didn't knock his hat off. His hat fell off while he was bashing me with a baton and... Um, and um, the other other cop um, said that I assaulted him, and I never even lifted my hands really. Uh, I never lifted li lifted my arm once. And um, the solution was that they were um, the, they came up with the solution was they're going to charge me with assault, and they'd throw their assault charges out if I dropped my assault charges. And the lawyer at the time said, um, it's in your best interest if you just drop them. You know, like, um, so I was going to get charged and 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 I uh, said, oh, well, I can't be stuffed um, going through. Um, um, and we just made an agreement to drop it all. Uh, um, that type of incident when you've, when you've tried to... Um, uh, do something about the experience that you've gone through through the legal system to then have to compromise because of a suggestion that you've assaulted a police officer by reason of mm. knocking his hat off. What, uh, you know, what kind of impact does that have? Did that have on you? Um, well, it just gives you a, a sense that you've got no right, uh, and and doesn't matter. Um, you know, like it just like, are you kidding? Um, um, these people can do whatever they want whenever they want however they want and it's like uh, with no consequences you know like and, and at the end of the day um, all I did was jump out of the car and said okay I'm out of the car I won't, won't bother about going you know like and and um, they just um, dived on me you know like as if I was a smart, wasn't smart at all um, I just um, um, just got attacked really The, the first incident incident that you mentioned to the commissioners in the police cell um, where there were a number of mm. police officers that you've said um, uh, well, uh, were in the cell with you. Um, uh, they were in the police station, not in the cell. In, in the police station. Mm. Uh, and there, um, you mentioned in your statement that there were some um, serious health consequences from being beaten. What can you tell the commissioners well, about I've, that? I've had constant um, headaches and and earring, not actually earring problems, but earring. Um, um, I've got tinnitus because of my because of I believe police, police brutality, um, and I've, I've more recently got a, an earring aid that plays. Um, um, some white noise, so I'm, I'm not. Uh, in two, two or three o'clock in the morning, it, this just screech, screeches, you know. I've got to put the hearing aid into play, something to to stop it from. So I've never had a. Uh, might be over 40 years, but I've never had a, a full night's sleep in all that long. Um, and it's like um, I've constantly have got this ear that, that rings, um, and I can't. Recall ever having a since then having a a, long, a good night's sleep, you know. Do you know other Aboriginal people in Victoria who have similar experiences to yours in terms of? Oh yeah, yeah I, I, I hear them all the time. Even even before I come out, I I see an uncle um, tells him some um, thing on Facebook around his case and and his the police police brutality you mentioned. So it's just it was just common common thing that um, um, 
and that um, people were were getting experience in violence. Uh, and you also mentioned a story about um, your experience of racism on on the part of police, and a story of uh, of around twenty years ago walking with your sons and nephews on the way to the swimming pool. Um, can you please tell the commissioners that story? Yeah, um, it's just one of the one of the incidents. Um, I was walking to Marupna Pool, um, taking my son and daughter and, and uh, two of my nephews up to the pool. They were probably 20 yards or even further in front of us because they'd run up ahead. And the police divisional van or divvy was just driving right beside them on the wrong side of the road, more or less harassing them or, you know, what are you, not even talking to them, just driving beside them. And and um, and by the time I get up there, they were saying something to me, uh, to me, to me son, and I just screamed out, "What the you know? What the heck are you used after? What do you want? You know, like leave the kids alone. They're going. To the, we're less than a hundred yards from the pool, and uh, they've got towels over their shoulders, and they've been harassed by police. So it's constant." Um, and that, look, that I've experienced many, many times like that. Well, not only my kids, but but myself and my mates, and and um, just constantly, um, you know. This is I, I talk about being free, you know. And I went overseas, and I felt free. The first time I felt free was when I was outside of this country. Inside of this country, I can't feel free, you know, because I've always got me. Uh, defences up for either racism or or violence, you know, like and and it's happened constantly, and that's through the pl- what the police have installed in me, um, and and probably a society um, has installed in me, you know. Um, you mention in your statement that so that you've you've had interactions, personal interactions with the criminal justice system um, for about 25 to 30 years, um, including one or two years in a boys' home and around six years in prison. You also mentioned that brutality wasn't as bad in prisons as it was in police stations, but there was still a lot of racism. Um, What type of racism did you experience um, while you were in custody in prison? In the prison system, um, look... um there was a lot of violence in there, but it wasn't mainly from from the prison officers. But um, um, it was always, you know, like Aboriginal people wouldn't get the same opportunities as as non-Aboriginal prisoners. Or um, and it and I don't know. If it seemed like racism to me, but um, um, you still get. Um, you wouldn't get the same opportunities as, as everyone else. And uh, you'd even get, um, um, you know, called uh, names like, you know, um, Blackfella or uh, Havo or, you know, s- stuff like that. Um, it was pretty common. And what type of impact does that have on you when you or during your time in prison? Well, It has a big impact, I, I think, because, you know, like, at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you just push that that crap down, you know, like, uh, over the years, and at the end of the day, you end up with this big um, uh, lot of baggage that, that you've pushed down over many years, you know. And the effects of that, uh, you know, like, like I said before, it's, it's like... You single out. Um, been single out all my life uh, uh, for my um, for my um, you know being Aboriginal. And paragraph, you you say something quite powerful. At paragraph twenty of your statement, if I can just read that out. Um, most of the young kids that have come up through the system all end up with a criminal record. That's the way it is. But most of us don't see ourselves as criminals. What's been taken from us is more than we'll ever take. We see society as the criminal more than us as the criminal. 
no one is taking responsibility for the crimes that were committed. Um, what, um, uh, in terms of making that statement, uh, you know, uh, how, um, how much do you see that your own experiences playing out today for other young men going through the system? Is it things, have things gotten better or have changed or do you still see some of the same problems happening um, today? I think it's all the same. No, nothing much has changed at all. Um, in that, you know, we, we're talking about trauma and transgenerational trauma, stuff that our ancestors have, 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 have uh, experienced. We, we still carry that. We don't get uh, um, much opportunity at all. Um, just read that out again because I, I've missed half of it. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, most of the young kids that come up through the system all end up with a criminal record. That's the way it is. But most of us don't see ourselves as criminals. Mm. What's been taken from us is more than we'll ever take. We see society as the criminal more than us as the criminal. No mm. one is taking responsibility for the crimes that were committed. Well, we just says everything, doesn't it? You know, like we're 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 um, we're uh, we're judged as criminals in our own in our own country, and um, and the people that that have taken our our um, uh, our be it land, our, our spirit, our our our, um, our identity as Aboriginal men. They've, yeah, pretty much taken our, our um, you know, our initiation from boy or to manhood kind of. They've taken our role as Aboriginal men away, and even our our women have uh, been dispossessed as 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 more more if if not more than than we have. But it's taken away from us, and no, no one's taken the responsibility for that. I believe. Uh, it's it's. Are you just kidding? Um, you. What I'm saying is is that we're seen as the thieves, and we look at um, look at um, this society as as you know not taking ownership of of, of what actually has happened there. You know. Um, how do I explain it more? It's pretty much self-explanatory, really. Um, uh, no one's, no one's um, said, OK, we've taken your land, we've taken your country, we've taken your kids, we've taken your, your life. Uh, how can we, how can we uh, not compensate? How can we fix that up? You know, how can we have you feeling like you're free in your own country when, when in your, on your own, own land or on your own, you know, like... Thing is that it's it's not going to happen, you know. Like, and I'd like to think that you um, can change things around, or the Justice Commission can have a look at look at look at um, that and and get someone to put their hand up and say, okay, um, let's change it. Because, but this society is not going to look at is not going to uh, take responsibility. Um, you've been clean for. 24, 25 years this May, mm. um, uh, and, and and you mention um, uh, the, the you, um, reasserting your connection to culture as part of that journey. Um, uh, you know, what inspired you to, to get clean in your life? Uh, it's it's a, it's a spiritual thing. It's like reconnect uh, reconnect spiritually to make myself stronger. Um, whereas um, Previous to that, addiction was the solution to problems. Uh, you know, it could be just relying on alcohol, just relying on yandy or, or what, whatever drugs that were, were out there um, to um, deal with the underlying um, trauma, pain, and 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 loss. You know, so addiction at its um, Served this purpose, uh, although it did cause a lot of lot of other dramas. Um, it also dealt with some of the underlying stuff, and this is the stuff that I'm talking about today. Um, and that I had to mask out a lot of 
um, a lot of the losses, a lot of the hurts, and a lot of the, um, well, is it racism and freedom that, um, loss of freedom. Um, um, until I got to a certain age and I thought, nah, nah, um, if I continue, I, I'd lose my life, you know, like, and I made a decision that I wanted to see my grandkids um, grow up and, and at that point I had no, I, I might have only had one grandchild. Um, um, in, um, in Canberra, I believe, and, and it was one year... And I made a decision, you know, that, that I wanted to be around. I wanted to be a strong, um, um, be a mentor or an ancestor for for my grandchildren, and and stopped um, after a little bit of effort, but eventually um, turning back to my connection to spirit, you know, like and my, my connection to to culture. Culture was a big part of me, me, um, me. Um, Becoming um, more connected spiritually, you know. And um, you, you reconnected with your mum um, when you were about thirty-six years old. How important was that to your journey? I might have been a little bit older than that, maybe thirty-six, thirty-eight, something like that. And it was just a, uh, going back, and I've, I've known of her and, and seen her a couple of times in the previous years, but never had no connection. Never lived uh, under the roof, same roof with her. Um, um, I just needed to know what happened and why, why, why the, I was I was left and she didn't come back. and And her explanation was was um, valid, was accepted, and 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 um, was able to move on from that because um, she told me that um, she remarried. Um, and had other children, but she couldn't come back and get me because he was um, he was um, a very violent person. He was, he, and she said her exact words were, "He would have killed you if you were to come back into this house." And he was um, he wasn't an Aboriginal man. He was a German man, uh, very violent uh, towards my my brothers and sister. Well, at least one of my brothers and. And sister, and and um, as well as um, she said that he wouldn't have, you couldn't have come back into that home. Um, although I did meet him um, once, um, um, I, I accepted her explanation and and moved on from that. I was pretty happy with the mum I grew up with, her auntie, and and her husband uh, actually got married on Rumbalara to adopt me, and. Um, and I remember that experience as well, and um, and I accepted them as my mum and dad. But um, yeah, she she passed away not long after. Not well, um, my my real mum passed away not long after that that explanation, and, and I was able to say thank you um, uh, for for bringing me into the world, and and I was able to take my younger son. To the Achuca Hospital when she did part on on the same um, um, fortnight when she was in hospital they then sent her home uh, to Camaraganja where she passed away but um, I was able to take my son there to to meet her and, and I let her know that I loved her and and was able to um, say goodbye to her and. You mentioned you mentioned early um, in your evidence um, that you've been working um, for a number of years now, for two decades, um, in drug and alcohol um, work, including for Aboriginal health services, um, as a support worker for members of the Stolen Generations, um, and now assisting um, men uh, in... Um, uh, who are involved in family violence? Um, what are the, some of the struggles that you see faced by the Aboriginal people you've worked with over the years? Well, well, the stolen gen, gen um, years with uh, Link Up Victoria. That was uh, I love that. I really like taking people back to 
back to country and, and, and meeting um, our people. And it was really, really strong and really loved that. Um, 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 that was... I probably jumped the gun there. Before that, I, after after I, I, I did rehab over 25 years ago, um, I was able to work in the Aboriginal Health Service as, as a cleaner and and uh, I remember talking to one of the staff there who was the drug and alcohol cancer and, and uh, I had a I, I had an inkling that she didn't know what she was blo what was doing and I thought to myself I'm going to have her job and I was I was cleaning floors and um, anyhow in three months time maybe a little bit longer that person either left because she was sick or she actually burned out because. Um, I think she, she might have got sick as well. And um, I said said to one of the workers there, Helen, Alan, Alan, I was saying I shouldn't say, Alan Brown, and I said, I want that job. And he said, it's yours. You know, like, it was that easy. I went from um, cleaning floors to becoming the drug alcohol counsellor, and th that was great. I went and done the cert for in, in drug and alcohol and, and got, got that qualification. Among others, I've got um, post you know, since then I've got heaps of qualifications, and and you know I started as a drug and alcohol counsellor, and work with with our, our people trying to get people um, clean and 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 deal with trauma. Then went to 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 link up and work with uh, Stole and Jen. Um, I had actually before that actually I went I went up to um, Eden Bega. Eden, Bega and Wallaga Lake and run three men's groups up there. And that was that was a good experience as well. I come back because my younger son was was playing, starting to play football that year, so I came back and 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 went back to link up again um, um, and then um, started working with Darty when Alan uh, Thorpe and John Byrne, they were there and, and they got funding to start a men's residential program, and um, I jumped on board with them, you know, to do the... the um, and eventually ended up managing the men's residential program and um, and um, done that for a couple of years. We actually won an award uh, for that program at that, that year. Um, yeah, you've been working with Darty since 2017 and... And you mentioned in your statement the 16-week residential program that Darty runs for um, for men who've been involved in family violence or mm. at risk of being involved in family violence. Can you tell the commissioners about that program and, and what that program well, does? Yeah, the, the um, Nagara Jaranuf men's residential program goes for 16 weeks and it works on works with men mainly who have had family violence or, or forms of violence or are at risk. Of being violent towards family, we've taken in guys that have um, got um, various types of anger, anger problems and trauma problems, and the, the program goes for um, 16 weeks and that can be extended to 20, 24. We've had guys stay in there up to nine months, really, um, and because you know it's really hard to go from a real well structured, supported place back out into community or back in, into societies. Sometimes guys want to stay a lo lot longer. And it's a, a nine-bed program, um, um, very successful uh, in getting people to look at um, their anger issues, their trauma issues and the underlying stuff that... that um, um, because it's about... Um, um, and it's more more nowadays focused on the addiction side of it. With the addiction comes the bad behaviour. Um, so a big part of it is is um, looking at um, where they're at. We're, we're currently <coughs> um, going back to a um, total abstinence based in in the men's residential, and it's a, a minimisation focus in the area where I'm at now with the community men's programs I run, I've been a part of running in three different, in Melbourne, Shepparton and Anichuka now. And um, we've got them groups going in Warrnambool, um, Gippsland, 
um, Morwell and Bairnsdale. So this this means to be able to change groups going right across the state. And we also do a lot of a uh, lot of the groups on Zoom for those guys that are working. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening, but it's all uh, family violence based. It's all you know uh, after the fact. Um, it's, it's like once the problems arisen, let's deal with it. It's kind of um, I, I, um, I'd like to see things a lot a lot of things happen happened them before and Daddy's been really good at that as well. We've got a lot of youth programs. We've got um, um, work, um, um, labour and traffic management and people being trained up to, to work. Um, and people, these are people without violence, family violence. Um, um, but uh, some, you know, like that want to go on and work. So there's all different areas that we're working with. Um, and um, I'd like to see it a lot more focused on. There's a lot of people out there that don't do violence towards their family that, that aren't getting supportive as well, so I'd like to build that up as well. Yeah, no, and I, I want to ask you some questions about the importance of prevention that you've highlighted in your statement. Um, but before I do that, in terms of the work that you do do at Darty right now. You mentioned in your statement that um, uh, that in your experience, uh, addiction is often as a result of the underlying trauma that a lot yeah. of um, Aboriginal people are suffering from. And I just wondered if you could just explain that to the commissioners in terms of your work and, and, and how you see that play out for, for, for Aboriginal people. Mm. I know. Look, people get on on these um, on these paths or these journeys, and they constantly go down, 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 and and want to be able to stop them before they go too far down. You know, or there's too much. Um, um, there's a lot of lot of trauma, and we. I even get it today with my uh, teenage. Uh, son and and my other uh, second eldest, second youngest son. Um, you know, there's no, there's not that much opportunity, and 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 they get on the on a thing where they're going down instead of there's got to be a way to kind of pull it up and 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 you know like make a um, make it a lot easier for for our youth to succeed. Instead of um, continue that journey down, you know, to where they where they um, where they they um, they continue to go until there's you know there's too much trouble, and then they've got to do something about themselves. Um, I don't know what you, what you mean. It just you know, we, we, we've just got a far more opportunity for our for our fellows. That's all. Mm. And and one of the programs where Darty is trying to create some of those opportunities, as I understand it, is um, some of the work in um, running a traffic management program and employment opportunities in construction. Um, yeah. uh, can you there's tell the commissioners just about those programs? And there's been a lot of lot of talk with um, 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 a few of the the um, construction teams that um, um, come around. Um, with, I've seen Al in lots of talks with some of the, the guys that um, that run some of those those uh, construction um, not sites, but teams that that um, employ Aboriginal people. Joel. Um, I forget his second name, but he's um, he's he's a right. Um, he's um, um, as well as um, some of the other guys that turn up there from construction sites. There's always discussion around around um, uh, employing Aboriginal people for the constructions of construction sites, train tunnels, um, all the stuff that's that's been going 
now. So there's a lot of talk around employment for Aboriginal people. Where in the past um, years gone by, there was never no no future for for Aboriginal people in in permanent employment. You know, like it was always going to be a seasonal work or part time in. Ab- I, I worked part time in Chapman Abattoirs for years, um, and and um, and also through seasonal work for years as well. I never had an opportunity down down there, but since I've been to Melbourne, like it's been 25 years, I've probably worked 23 years of it. So, so, um, and that was a choice I made to to turn my life around. So the choice is not there for a lot of a lot of people. Um, to turn it around, you know, and with what Dardy's doing, and and, um, and I'm sure there are other other organisations putting things in place for um, for our mob to to um, be um, be successful. You know, like places like VACA and 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 stuff like that. You know, like and the prison. There's I see a lot of um, a lot of our children still been removed. I've seen a lot of a um, lot more women in prisons than ever before, um, and I think there's a lot more men in prisons than ever before. Than uh, and I can't I can't I can't put words to it. Describe what's happening. You know, like um, it's getting worse, um, and and a lot of our organisations can become a part of the system that that's um, that's not um, providing any solutions for our for our people. And you mentioned in your statement some one of the challenges that for Dadi is also um, um, uh, funding competition between organisations and the difficulties with getting funding and some of the requirements that are imposed on organisations as a result of funding. Um, can you just describe to the Commission as some of those challenges? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty... Um, ..pretty illiterate when it comes to, you know, applying for funding and doing all, all that, but, you know, I'm just kind of... I'll be there on the ground working uh, with my people, but... At the end of the day, what I see is is there's competitions between organisations. Okay, we've built all these great organisations, and and, and uh, it'd be good if they were given money to do what they needed to do instead of compete with each other to uh, get that um, get the get that bucket of money. You know, like there's there's very limited amount that's coming to um, back to our people. Um, that really need the help, um, um, and organisations, um, have, I think, have been disempowered uh, spiritually, and 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 it's around the ability to, you know, you've got to compete with other organisations. I remember when we were all one people, and we were all um, there was that spiritual. It's a, it's a, it is a spiritual. Um, um, Thing that we, we we all had where we were all um, fighting this fight as one and now it's all been um, disconnected and separated like I remember when I when I first work worked in when I was working in Ab- Aboriginal in VARS um, Victorian Aboriginal Health Service and and we're all just one po- mob you know and we're all there and we'd all support each other and all of a sudden, it was like you can't get this funding unless you go in partner with this mainstream organisation, or we have to be, become partnerships. You know, like, and I thought straight away as soon as that started to happen, I thought, oh, here we go again. We're going to lose everything again, and we're pretty much. Uh, it's not as um, it's not the same community control organisation as as it was when it was a community control organisation. It's pretty much. Um, you know, like um, we've lost that connection as community. Uh, and you also mentioned an experience you had when you were running the Maya Healing Centre. Um, 
uh, at paragraph 43 of your statement where you said you, you lost your funding because you hired a cook, uh, a cleaner and a maintenance man, but apparently that <coughs> wasn't what the funding was for. Can you just tell the commissioners? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty much... Um, the Mayor Healing Centre was a, the first... Um, first um, Aboriginal Healing Centre in Victoria, and we were we were very successful. We operated for eight years, five years voluntarily, and then the last three years we become um, registered as Maya, and 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 we were looking for drug and alcohol um, money to deal with the addiction in the community and 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 start trauma programs, and we have already. Had, had people in there training us up in the area of trauma and dealing with trauma and all that kind of stuff. And then at the at the time, Uncle Reg, um, he was he was Uncle Reg Blow. He was the um, uh, CEO, and and we'd kind of I, I, I kind of got into his ear a year or two before that to to chase more funding, and and he, he kind of mentioned that we weren't ready for it yet, and I said. When when ain't you ready for more funding? You know, like and and um, and anyhow, we did get some money to run the family. We, we applied for drug and alcohol money, and we couldn't get that to run drug and alcohol programs. We got money for family violence. The family violence program we run successful family violence programs, and we kind of got two and a half years into into that three year funding, and and. Uh, I think we ended up having about ninety thousand dollars surplus, and and Uncle Reg had of his uh, had a bright idea to hire a cook and and uh, a cook and a cleaner and and a maintenance worker out of that for the the next six months, and that cook was Tanya Day if you remember her. She was the cook, and her partner were were was the um, cleaner and. And there was some family violence issues there. That's why they'd come come there, and they were doing really well. And next minute, we know we we got pulled over the over the coals because um, that was not that funding wasn't appropriate for for staff. It was uh, program money, and um, we got defunded for for that. Um, um, we weren't going to be refunded uh, to continue the program, so it ended up um, um, stopping um, the mayor, and, and I think Vars took it over, and then I think uh, Darty took it over from Vars as well. So it was the same same money, same program that that was um, that that we had initially, but we got the, uh, stopped because of. Um, 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 Using money inappropriately, um, and if Uncle Reg had just went and got some more funding for the for the cook and that would have been still going, I suppose. But at the end of the day, it was just uh, one of those experiences, and I thought um, something that I needed to let go and didn't um, didn't bother with with following up anything uh, around that. Um, although Maya's still a registered body today and it still has uh, it's just got a, a, a new building in Echuca. I'm not I'm not a part of that no more for now uh, in terms of the you've been heavily involved in running men's programs and that's that's a key part of what you do now um, uh, can you tell the commissioners about given your your history and your involvement in, in criminal justice issues um, for a long time um, and now in drug and alcohol um, counselling. What's your approach during men's groups? How do you work with men who might be struggling with addiction um, given your own lived experience? Oh, look, um, I'm, I'm probably not classed as a drug and alcohol counsellor now. I've gone on to do a lot more than than them, them uh, um, credentials. I've, I've come a, um, to a a postgraduate certificate in family therapy. I've become a, a therapist in journey healing. I've become a, therap a therapist in um, soul link healing. So I've got all these different m modalities. But my main thing is to work with um, Aboriginal men uh, at the moment, um, and I focus mainly around uh, the men's behavioural change stuff with family violence. That's where I'm at at the moment. 
Um, um, what was the last part of that? Oh, but what's your approach? What approach do you take in, in oh, given look, all the, your skills and, and lived look, experience? With, when, with when I was at uh, NJP, Nagara Jano, the men's residential, we were, we were at a t total abstinence kind of model then and we got an 82% 82, 82 success rate. I think it's gone down to less than 60% now because we really, there was other... You know, people can come in using medications and using uh, drug replacements. I think that's going to go out again because unless you're ready to do a men's behavioural change, you're not going to really get m much out of it if you're on on uh, on a um, on is it how do you pronounce it? Not drug replacement. That sounds vitromorphine. Um, buprenorphine? Yeah, buprenorphine or methadone or not methadone, but, you know, um, pharmaceutical programs, they get away with that. Um, um, and nothing much can be taught and, and nothing much can be experienced um, with um, learning and connecting to spirit if you continue... On that, so when the guys are ready, they can come in if they want to get off. That eventually, they can come in and do do that. Or if they want to do that, they can do um, do the um, community programs. We're not, um, you know, like men's behavioural change programs. You run through the community programs, um, except people that are still drinking and then drugging. That's okay. But uh, I think. I think to get to the um, men's residential stage of it, you're extreme. You know, we're taking people out of jails, we're taking people out of, um, um, you know, like um, straight out of court um, who are going to get sent to prison. Um, them, them guys have got to take it very serious. Um, a lot of our men in the community programs can really um, manage to work and can manage to can still be in community, you know. So um, my thing is about... I, I teach a lot of, lot of the guys about what addiction is, um, the cycles of addiction and what addiction is, the, the mental obsession coupled with the physical allergy and all the, all the stuff that goes with, with addiction and how to under, pretty much understand what addiction is. And you wouldn't believe it, I forgot to turn my phone off. <laughs> Sorry. Mate, I'll have to get back to you, OK? Can you cut that out, please? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ron, I'll have to get back to you, OK? Sorry. I'm in a meeting, mate. See ya. Yeah, bye. It's one of our clients. Um, sorry about that. I, I tried. I, I turned that off when I was in there, but I turned it back on to make a phone call. I forgot to turn it off again. Um, just let's, let's hope no one else rings us in the next half hour. Um, where was I? Yeah, I like to pass on, you know, like my experience. Um, um, during some of this uh, for Aboriginal men, it makes it real, really easy, uh, easier to understand the journey of their own own people through through the through the through what they've been going through. You know, like so, we've had really good success rates, um, especially with that guy that's just ringing me. He's waiting to go into the men's residential, and that's under the recommendations of. You know, that's someone w I've done work with in prison and and outside um, as well. Um, a really strong community member. But, you know, just passing on my own life experience and, and understanding of, of, of culture and, and, and our connection spiritually, you know. People don't really get that until you drum it into head and... and um, well, you don't have to drum it into you just got to got to explain it to them, and, and they understand. You know, like um, our um, our journey spiritually as a as a as a um, as a people. Um, I'll just let them know that uh, we've been here for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years spiritually. But um, as you know, um, 
as humans we've only been here for less than 60 most of them less than 50 a lot younger than that a lot a lot of them so it's just understanding um, our ancestors journey and our connection spiritually that that uh, a lot of our youth have lost um, they don't understand um, a lot of our youth don't understand the importance of their identity and their connection to culture so it's just a lot of um, a lot of getting a lot of people to understand that and using that as a strength to 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 um, get them through this dark period of their life. Uh, you mentioned a few times today and also in your statement that <coughs> um, that you'd like to see more prevention programs. That a lot of the programs you've worked on um, happen once family violence has occurred or, or addiction issues have arisen, um, what are some of the prevention programs you'd like to see um, uh, existing for Aboriginal Victorians? Uh, it's, really, it's really difficult. I'd, I'd like to be um, able to teach a lot of the stuff that we do in, in schools. I'd like to be able to tell our, our children what what this about and I'd like to get a lot of help out to the families that really are disconnected and they're not going to get opportunities you know like there's a there's a lot of people um, look a lot of our people are doing really well and that's great and 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 I'm probably one of them although I've got problems still um, um, that and we'll get lots of opportunity you know that there's a lot of a lot of our kids out there that youth growing up and, and families that are not going to get much opportunity uh, and and so places like um, Darty are doing excellent great um, and I'd, I'd like to see uh, pla um, places like um, bars and 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 even even VACO focused on on different areas of, of making families stronger um, I'd like to see the May Healing Centre up and running again. It was defunded uh, and it was... We had three staff working with 30 or 40 people a day, you know, and these people were staying um, clean and sober to come to our programs. Just stuff like that, you know. I'd like to see more opportunity uh, for... Um, I know there's healing centres going up, uh, but are they focusing on the right people that I know... That, uh, I, I know that um, we'd been there in the past and we were successful, so um, I'd like to see probably more opportunity around the addiction side of it as well. People, people who survive that have to um, continually be at a rock bottom to to survive it. There's, there's some way that we can work on getting people, um, you know, um, I'm working with a lot during uh, community programs, during um, our men's behavioural change group. For a lot of the, some of these people haven't got family violence history. Uh, just making making sure that there are healing centres there that, that, that continue to help our people. And <coughs> you mentioned in your statement that in June of this year, Darty um, will get its own clinic for men and women going through detox. Um, why is that important for Darty to be running its own clinic? Well, it's, it's, if you give the if you give the the person or or, or our people the opportunity to look at um, new directions in life, other than you know continue on down that that road, um, we could. We can we can turn it around, you know. Like Victoria is a, a big big place. You've got towns everywhere, and there's a lot of addiction in every town, really. Um, if we can focus on on helping, uh, I think Darty has got the building. It's just refurbishing it now to open up its own own detox, and then then people coming through the detox will go into a uh, uh, rehab, be it. Gully Amble or Windjil Oven, albeit our own houses, we've got our own houses that will will also be a part of a, a rehab situation. So, and and straight from there into um, work or training to work, you know, getting people uh, 
work ready and opportunities to 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 leave that lifestyle behind. And that lifestyle is going to always be there because there's a lot of trauma in our communities, and there's a lot of um, dispossession, and we've got a lot of a lot of um, um, drug dealers that prey on um, prey on vulnerable people, and that's we know that's the way it way um, um, it works. You know, like um, there's a lot of money be, to be made off people's trauma as well. Um. A, a final issue before I um, ask if the commissioners have any questions. Um, uh, you're an elder or have been an elder at the Quarry Court, including at Broadmeadows, Heidelberg and in Melbourne. Um, uh, what's been your experience of, of the Quarry Court and, and how do you think that can contribute to um, issues in criminal justice? Oh, look. A lot of community don't like Curry Court, but I, I, I love it. Um, I've watched my own son go through there and I've supported him when he was going through there. And, he, and it was a kind of um, 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 the first time he'd got to sit down and talk to elders and, and about his journey and what, what he was doing with his life. And eventually he turned it around. You know, it's been five years since he's been there, but, um, um, you know, like I, I took the opportunity of... of Applying and now sitting on on um, on um, Broadmeadows and Alderberg and Melbourne Mag Magistrates Court as a as a as an elder, um, and um, you know just just letting them know that that journey that they're on is is not the the, the right journey they should be on, and that there is places now that are, that are looking at uh, the particular problems, be it. Uh, alcohol, uh, drugs, um, um, and and um, you know I've even got um, um, some um, women um, involved in the women's group at Darty for uh, like um, family violence, you know, like um, and that there is there's a lot more opportunity, you know, not only with um, with Dardy Mawara, but with bars, there's drug and alcohol counsellors, there's um, um, counsellors and trauma therapists there that, that that deal with underlying trauma. So I'm, I like sitting on the because I can direct them and ask them. I can talk to them what they're doing about, ask them what they're doing about their particular uh, addiction problem and all that kind of stuff. You know, like and and uh, direct them um, and. I think I get a lot of um, not only respect from them, but but you know um, they thank you for the advice that you give them, and and a lot of them will, a lot of them will follow up, but a lot of them ain't, just aren't ready as well. Uh, some of them are just aren't ready. A lot of them will follow up what you do, but mainly I, I point them towards the, the right services and make sure that they um, follow it up, and even give them my card to make sure that they ring us. Or ring bars, or ring whoever, whoever you know. I've only got one last question, but um, thought I'd ask commissioners if if there were any questions that you wanted to ask, Uncle Ross. Start, I might start this in Maggie. Would you? Uh, oh, j just a, a small one, Ross. Thank you. Um, I, I was struck when you were talking about the different services you work with, including the Mayor Healing Centre, which was then defunded, and just. Um, the the problem we've got places like Dardy who are doing fantastic stuff and now doing this and more and more, but there's always the threat of defunding or the limits being placed on what where they can go. So I guess I'm asking if how would you see if you could design the funding system to be more self determining. Uh, rather than constantly relying on applying for different funding for different things. How would you do that? Well, my ideal um, solution is is someone take responsibility for what's ha what, for what's happening in this country and and fund appropriately appropriate programs instead of making a system where where people are, um, in different organisations are, are competing against each other to do what they need to do. Um, um, so. 
that would be the perfect solution if if someone would say yes, well we've done this, let's let us fix it, He's, he, go for it, and uh, and but that's never going to happen in my lifetime, I don't think. But um, I suppose it's it's still a numbers game and still about the figures and still about um, still still about. Um, or you know, Amy are getting through. Look, we've got eighty-two percent through, and we've got over capacity of, of, of our residential program. And even in our men's behavioural change groups, it's like I do thirty men. Um, I do a group with thirty men uh, on a Monday night, and and you know, um, eight up in in Shep, ten. There was nine of us up in in Echuga the other day. So the groups are getting bigger. Um, we don't get funded for all them. We don't get funded for a church. Uh, we don't. Yeah, we just do it, you know, because the men need need something. We go up there. Um, we're going to um, talk a little bit more about what we can get, even if it's just some petrol money or some. I don't know. How would you How would you go about it? Yeah, it's all about the stats and the numbers you get through and what you do. Just go to the cemeteries and see how many Aboriginal people are dying. Before they're fifty, you know. Before they're forty. Before they're thirty. Even you know, like, like suicides, bloody way up there, um, compared with lots of, uh, with other years anyhow. So, the stats are already there. Go to the prison, see how many Aboriginal people are in there. The stats are there. You know, you don't need um, to be a program running. Uh, by the stats you provide, you, you know, like it's like um, the prison system and the and the and the uh, funeral funeral parlours will give you the stats of what's what's happening. Um, I think it's become too reliant, and I had to miss a smoke ceremony this morning. <laughs> Daddy runs a smoke ceremony every Monday and every Friday. I had to miss one because I had to go into a, into a into a staff meeting to to talk about you know other other stuff around around uh, our running the program properly, which is okay. But I'd like to just relax and go out and take everyone out and just do the bloody ceremony, and 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 instead of worrying about government structures that take away our culture and our connection, you know. So um, that's pretty much. My beliefs is we're never going to succeed. Uh, we're never going to uh, be um, united uh, because of the, the structures that the government's put in place. Commissioner Herbert? Yeah, thanks for coming and sharing um, you know, your story as well. Um, can you talk to us about... Um, you work with a lot of you know men and women, but particularly men you've talked about today, mm. and disconnected to culture, country, and community. Mm. Um, how many, or I mean, obviously we're not asking for you know exact figures or anything, but but how many have been engaged in the child protection system that you have had to work with over your journey? With within the last five years, I've been with Daddy, and I've been with working with Thorpe and. And with Maya and all that yep. through family violence for forever. Um, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was all because of uh, um, child protection. You know, uh, all those years working with with Aboriginal men and and Aboriginal families, it was always about making the family strong or getting the family right for for. Um, for the children, but I th so I, I presumed it was all about um, child protection, you know. But um, what do you mean, actually? So like like the, the the men that you're working with that yeah. have had, you know, a lot of um, historical trauma, but also disconnected from culture, country. Yeah. Are they um, are those uh, men um, uh, been engaged in the child protection system? Uh, who are now later on in life, you're working with them to try to help them change no, their not, lives, their not, lifestyle. Not now I get, I get what you're talking about. Yeah. No, not necessarily. Not yeah. all of not all of them have come through um, 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 through that child protection system that I that I know of. Uh, I'm not too sure of the exact amount, but 
there are there are a few that have come through, but I would I would, I'm not too sure about how many they. Yep. Can I have another one? Not that. Um, Curry Court, Curry Court system. Um, you're talking about um, being an elder on the Curry Courts. Um, and you've been there how long now? A few years. Oh, I think this is my, might be my third year. My third year, yeah, second, third two, year. Years, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's some limitations with the Curry Court model. Um, but have you? Um, do you have any ideas around how the model could be enhanced to further support um, our people going before the system? Going um, before the system. Yeah. So at the moment we don't have family violence matters or matters, um, you know, like adults have to plead guilty, for instance, and so forth. Is there any? Do you have any ideas and um, around how we could, you know, how the Curry courts could do things differently? In your view. Well, the way I see it now, the Curry court doesn't deal with family violence. Mm. There was some training um, for the elders, and including myself, and I was a part of that training as well, um, to build up their ability to able to hear family violence cases, but it hasn't gone ahead as yet, so we're still not taking family violence mm. in, um, I think it's might be Melbourne, Brody and Heidelberg, but that's going to change in the future, I think. Um, I think there is family violence heard in some of the county courts, um, not the magistrates' courts. So I don't do the county courts as yet, only because I'm, I'm overworked and I'm, uh, at the moment and I don't want to kind of jump into that, um, that as yet. So I'm just, at the moment, just filling in for the Koori courts. Uh, probably lucky to get uh, once a fortnight. Uh, I just haven't got the time. Um, thanks, Uncle, for coming and giving your evidence. It's an honour. Um, I just wanted to ask, in your witness statement, it says there's nothing focused on prevention. It's all focused on after the fact. And I was just, from your perspective, what does prevention look like? Well, probably prevention is is be it um, prevention from committing crimes or prevention from doing drugs and doing alcohol. You've got places like um, Fitzroy Stars Footy Club and all that really good at at prevention. Although they've they've got problems with over the years had, had problems, um, but uh, it's more focused now on, on a more, um, you know, sp uh, sport and, and, and um, more positive lifestyle, whereas the old Fitzroy Stars days, it was a little bit different than that, uh, where there was, there was sometimes drugs and a lot of, a lot of alcohol around, but um, it's not as much uh, of the focus no more. It's like more of a... Um, um, positive lifestyle and sportsman -like lifestyle, uh, and that's what I will talk, think about prevention. Something like that, but it, it doesn't have to be um, football. It could be boxing. We've had Fitzroy Stars gym. There's a lot of gyms Australia wide where where focus on healthy lifestyle and and discipline in their sport. You know, so. Um, Golf is another one that's up and running with some of the, um, um, I don't know about the youth, but a lot of the older fellas are out there playing uh, in the you know, Koori youth team. But, you know, some positive um, um, stuff would be to build programs where education in schools, you know, having people come in like myself or people that come in talking about this is the lifestyle, this is where you're going, this is where you're, what's going to happen. Teaching something about our culture and our language in schools would be great, but um, more, more of a... Um, and I think a lot of the organisations are starting to work on it, but um, um, Rumba and, and that have got some good things happening up there in the new... the new uh, college that's going up up there, I forget the name of it, um, um, the School of Excellence or something like that. But, but uh, 
just some positive, more positive um, stuff that's that's um, to prevent that road downhill, you know. Mm. Although there's still a lot of people out there that are turning to drugs and alcohol um, that make it really difficult. Yeah, and just um, because um, other people with mere evidence talk about the disconnection from culture, um, and you mentioned before in some of the work, and, and I know you've worked at Link Cup and, and places like that, um, that reconnection work that you said you do within sort of men's behaviour, you talk about culture and, mm. you know, do you find that connection, just a little bit more about that connecting people back to their their culture and their, their who they are as an Aboriginal yeah, yeah. man? I find, you know, like it's really, it's really easy to talk to Aboriginal men and and even women, but even men who, who have been displaced and, and lost to to understand, even if you're just talking to them, they make the decision that there is that spirit there, that there is that spirit of our ancestors are still with us and going to make us stronger. If they just, it's just a belief that they have got to connect to. And they've got to be told about, you know what I mean? Like, and say it's all, it's already there with you. You've just got to con- reach out and connect to it, you know, like and believe it. It's it's it can be as simple as that. But just letting, because a lot of the, a lot of the guys are just walking around lost and either in their addiction or in their trauma, uh, and and thinking that this is it. I don't want to. What am I going to do with my life? I'm going to give up and all that. But you know, you're strong. You're a strong person. Your ancestors have come through. Uh, you know, like the last 240 years or something, 30-something years, um, 50 times more trauma than you will ever, ever, ever go through. You've got it good now compared to what they've gone through. So, you know, um, uh, um, and they come through connected to that culture and that spirit. You make sure that you you want that. And, and it's just about making a decision that, OK, I'm going to be strong. Um, I'm going to connect to my ancestor spirit. I'm going to connect to Creator. I'm going to connect to whatever it is. A bit God. I believe in God. There's no tr- problem there with me. Um, a lot of our people um, don't um, want to mention God, but they un- don't understand that God's a word for Creator. Just a short word. You know? So it's um, it's. It's pretty easy to explain to them and, and pretty easy for them to accept. Um, you're going to get those <laughs> those ones that don't accept are the ones uh, mentally incapable due to uh, be it, uh, addiction or, or art edness um, or um, mentally incapable or... or, or um, just unable to become honest with themselves, and you can sort them out. Them, the, them guys don't want help, and they, you know, they don't hang around for long. But the other guys who really do want help, they'll listen, and they'll connect, and they'll make a few slip ups. But eventually, they'll they'll remember what you said, and and eventually they'll they'll pull through it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Uncle Ross, thank you for sharing your story uh, and, and your wisdom. Thanks. Uh, the um, the commission is very well aware of where you grew up on the flats. Uh, we've been there, um, and uh, we were led by Uncle Col and by Uncle Wayne. Uh, it was a memorable occasion, and I honour that place and I honour that place for its importance to you and many other people in the community. Uh, my first question is similar to the one that uh, Commissioner uh, Hunter asked, but I, I want to ask specifically about the issue of spiritual connection with country. Uh, and in paragraph 40 and 41 uh, of your statement, uh, you begin by saying that money is divided up and everyone is made to compete with each other. There should be there's not one place running a program, and you covered that. Uh, in the next paragraph, you, you say it should be about connection and the importance of community, but that's not there anymore. The spiritual connection with country has been taken out by government policies and that's the way things now run. What do you mean uh, by this statement, the spiritual connection with country has been taken out by government policies? 
Oh, um, what do I mean by that? Um, probably, probably not so much country, but community. Um, um, the, this, this, the separation of, of and pulling apart of, of, of us Aboriginal people as a spiritual entity, you know, like we've only got to sit together and we know we're connecting spiritually, you know what I mean? Like an Aboriginal person's only got to be sitting down talking to each other and and they can understand that connection spiritually. But I'm, I'm t- thinking about how it's been, been um, done through our organisations, through our, the funding bodies, through the separation... Um, um, and our connection to country pretty much um, stems from that, you know, like um, our... Read that again to me. Our yes. What the, the, really, you make a complaint, uh, and the complaint is that spiritual connection with country has been taken out by government policies in the programs that are funded. Yeah, I don't know. It's probably... I'm looking at... at um, my own own country, Yorta Yorta country, Yorta Yorta nations, and um, our. Okay, we've got rappers of Yorta Yorta nations, and and most of our most of our most of our our people have got that connection to country because, you know, like it's it's run by one entity, and yeah. and you know you can go down the river and all that and connect, but I mean it's like. We should be all free and all accepted, uh, and there should be enough for everyone. You know, there's very little for um, all people in your your, your yes. nations. Yes. Very little, um, um, and and a lot of our, our our people don't receive anything. Yes. You know what I mean? Okay. Whereas uh, we've got very few workers. Uh, although we we are getting stuff happening, like other other enterprises happening through your, your nation, but I'm just thinking most of our people don't see anything and don't do, do anything, you know. So that connection to our country is like we're your, your people are here and we're not getting nothing for it. So, no. like, um, so it's just back to that basic um, recognition that, that, you know, like our land that's been taken from us. We get rights to... What do you call it? Uh, Crown land. Mm. You know? Crown land. You can go and look after crown land. That's you. You know? Um, That's your... That's your identity is... We've got staff looking after crown land. You know, like... And and it's all our land. You know what I mean? We we, we don't get... We've got no... Recognition of it, you know, like um, when we lost our native title thing, it was because we pro- couldn't prove we lived off the land. I mean, we were forced off the bloody land. Well, what do you mean? How do we expect to live off the land when we're forced off it? You know? Yes. Um, My missions and that, you know, like, and. Thank you. Mm. Uh, my next question is directed uh, to the Curry Court and to you as an elder with that court. Mm. Uh, we've heard uh, a lot of evidence uh, complaining that it's necessary to plead guilty uh, in order uh, to appear in the Koori Court as an Aboriginal person. Mm. Uh, in in some other uh, countries, uh, there are three kinds of pleas. We only have two. The two we've got are guilty and not guilty. In other countries, uh, offend, accused persons can plead no contest. So not guilty, guilty or no contest. In other words, they don't want to plead guilty, uh, but they um, agree uh, that they won't fight the charge. Uh, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, and I'm not sure that you fully have understood exactly what I've just said. My favourite subject. No? Your favourite subject. Well, I'm, <coughs> I'm just I'm asking for your... I'm old rest- school. Right? If you do the crime, yeah. you do the time, you know? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. like... Um, um, and you don't have to plead guilty. Yeah. Don't go to Koori Court. Simple as that. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's how I see it. Yeah. And and you got Koori Court there. If you've been caught and and you're willing to accept um, that you've been caught and and um, uh, then plead guilty and you sit next to the elders and we'll tell you what you, you should be doing. You know, or 
if you're not guilty, why would you be sitting there pleading guilty? You know what I mean? Mm. I've been caught um, at least three times that, that I've, I've caught um, charges and, and beat them through county court uh, in my in my years. You know, like, and so I'm big big on you know if you if you're doing the crime, you've got to do the time. You know, either that, go and see the eldest, go and talk about it, and and pull it pull your pull your head in, change your behaviour. You know, that's my 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 thing. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I don't have a question, but I do want to thank you for the evidence you've given and the way you've told your story and used it as a way to make change, quite frankly. And uh, for my part, I'm very... Um, I won't forget your uh, last sentence and 20. No one is taking responsibility for the crimes that were committed. Royal Commission is about making some redress for crimes committed towards our people, and I hope that we're able to do that successfully. So thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Uncle Ross. Is there anything else that you want to tell the commissioners before we finish? No, no, probably not at this stage. I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, yeah. No, I'm pretty happy with um, how, how, how we've been treated here today, and I want to thank you all for the really good work. I'm, I'm just, I'm just concerned um, about the old treaty processes that's happening now. I've got major concerns about that um, around, um, you know, our people signing a peace treaty um, with anyone means that. You know, like, uh, in my view, and I, it, I don't know if, if it's the right, right view or not, is that we sign a, a, a peace treaty with with the Australian government or, or with the state government is is that that we 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 um, we sign away our sovereignty. We we kind of um, it's like okay, you've got our land, you've stolen, you're on stolen land. Now we've signed this peace treaty, that land's no longer stolen. That's my concern, you know. Do you think any of our people will want to sign a peace treaty? Is it a peace treaty or is it... No, what, no, what no, is, well, no what I'm is just a saying treaty, I though? don't think... I couldn't imagine people wanting to sign no, a peace no, treaty. They'd no. want a but that's what purposeful a tr treaty. Yeah, that's what a treaty is. It's a peace treaty, isn't it? Well... It's not necessarily a peace treaty? Well, I think it can be many things, can it not? I'm, Many things. What I'm not too sure about where your rook goes with the treaty. That's all. That's that's probably well, my concern. We're, we're you're you're one of the first few to raise treaty. Actually, eh? uh, you're one of the first few people to raise treaty with us. Nobody oh, else yeah, no. has raised it. Well, I, yeah, I just thought. But, but uh, we haven't heard really from our communities what they are thinking about treaty. Really, mm. at this stage. Okay. Uh, I'm just. Anyway, I just thought you. I'd mention it. That was one of my concerns. Someone said, "Have you got any other concerns?" Uh, I like your Rook Justice Commission uh, truth telling and all that. It's great. It's got to be got to be done. Um, I just thought I'd mention. I don't know what the treaty's about. Um, More to be said, I'm sure. More to be said. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Those are. Uh, Questions that I had. So, so we've concluded today's session. So thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you, commissioners. Thank, I'm you. Going to go thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>